as you do that, uh, I'll go ahead and ask the question, who here is excited about Jose and Dini having a baby? All right. Who thinks they should name it Adrian? I got my, I got my family. I got one more. All right. Got one more. Who thinks we should learn the Canadian national anthem by the time the baby's born? We could, we could try that. We could, we could try. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. All I know is, oh, Canada. You know why they sing that? Because, like, oh, Canada. <laughs> All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in one hand, America. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in the other. All right, stand with me. We're going to read a little bit. We'll read a little bit in both passages. These are the, the two main passages. Can you give me the water? Um, that uh, really describe for us this third judgment in our series on uh, the seven judgments that are the main judgments that are listed in the New Testament, in the Bible, really. And I, I think it's really important to get to know this one. I, I think um, th there's a lot of confusion about, first off, the judgments of God. And that God is a God of judgment. I mean, that right there, you say that, and that by itself is controversial today. Because people have painted God into a, I don't know, uh, one-dimensional being, all right? God is love, and I'm thankful that God is love. But let me say this, I'm thankful that He is a holy kind of love, all right? There's no perversion in there. There's nothing, there's no twisting of, of what is right in His love. And so you say, why is that? Because He's holy, and therefore you have to look at the judgment of God. And so this is the third judgment we're going to look at uh, in our series, and it's called the Judgment Seat of Christ. All right, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, starting in verse number 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. By the way, fair warning, uh, we're going to go quickly, but we've got a lot of Scripture to look at. And the, and the reason for that is, is, I really want to give you, and if you have to go back and look at the references, please do that. Uh, uh, I, but I want you to have all the information you need in regards to this subject, all right? Uh, it says here, we, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. He's talking about the fact that if you're saved, you've got a physical body right now, and you're waiting for the rapture. You're waiting for your body to be changed to go from having an earthly house to having a, hev a heavenly house. Uh, I don't know about you. Maybe when you're a teenager, you feel invincible. In your early 20s, you feel invincible. You hit 30 and you realize this ain't all it's cracked up to be. Amen. Uh, and you realize real quickly, there's got to be something better than this. And there is. It's up there. And that's what he's talking about. All right. He says uh, in verse 3, if so, be, uh, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. We're going to come back to what that's talking about. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. He talks about that in the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, the rapture. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is of God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith... Not by sight, easier said than done, right? We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There's, there's no guesswork involved. If you're saved, you know, when you kick the bucket, you're in the presence of Jesus Christ. There's no guesswork involved, right? If you're, if you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. Look at verse 9. Wherefore, we labor. That's important to look at. We're going to come back to why it's important. We labor that whether present... That means in this body, or absent, that means in glory, we, sh we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. All right, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. So he, he mentions there that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, you may not know much about it. Some of you are like, I've heard about this, I know about this. Well, if you've heard about it, let me get you to think about some things tonight that maybe you haven't thought about. 
And if you've never heard of it before, you might be uh, like the guy Apollos in the book of Acts, where Paul comes to him and says, uh, have you received the Holy Ghost? And he goes, I don't know that there is such a thing called the Holy Ghost. And he goes, well, what were you baptized unto? And he says, well, I was baptized unto John's baptism. In other words, here this guy is, he doesn't know beyond what has been told to him. So if you're here tonight, you're like, I don't know what this is all about. That's why we're learning about it. All right. First Corinthians chapter three. Uh, look, if you would, at verse number nine, for we are laborers together with God. Isn't that something? If you're saved, God's not just asking you to work for him. He's asking you to work with him. That's a blessing. All right. You are God's husbandry. That's like a vineyard. You are God's building according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise Master builder. He's the GC, right? Uh, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, here we go, gold, silver, precious stones, these are the things that will last through a fire. Then he goes into some things that won't last. Wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. What day is that? The judgment seat of Christ. The day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. What's the it? The man's work. Your work. Not your soul. All right? Not you, but your work. All right? It says here, it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort. It is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. That's good news. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Let's just make this very clear. You cannot lose your salvation. All right. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. Yet so as by fire. So uh, what you've got is the two main passages about the judgment seat of Christ. And before we get into this any further, I want to go ahead and ask the Lord to bless it. Father, thank you for the word of God tonight. Lord, thank you for this Bible. Thank you that it's perfect. Thank you that we don't have to doubt what anything that you said. Lord, what you said, you gave to us, and you preserved it perfectly for us to have exactly how you wanted us to have it. And Lord, tonight I pray that you fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you make me a, a Spirit-filled preacher and make everybody out there Spirit-filled listeners. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that maybe they're good, maybe they're religious, but they've never trusted you as their Savior, that they would consider their eternal soul. They consider their eternal destination. And Lord, for every believer in here tonight, that they would not leave this place without considering this judgment. And Lord, that you make us more conscious and more aware of how we live in light of the fact that we're going to face you someday and give account of our lives. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Now, again, I want to stress this because if you weren't here for all the judgments that we've talked about, judgment number one is a judgment that takes place at Calvary. That means when Jesus Christ died on the cross... When you got saved, you said, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I know I deserve it. I know I've sinned against the Holy God. I know that because you're eternal, my punishment will be eternal. I don't want that. You said there's a way out. Lord, I, I, I ask that you would save me. You know what he did? He took your sins and he put them on Jesus Christ and he poured out all his wrath on Jesus Christ. And he took all the righteousness and the perfect life of Jesus Christ and he put it on your account. He said, I like you. Isn't that a blessing? God, that's the first judgment that we talked about, all right? Second judgment we talked about is now that you're saved, if you've trusted Christ, every single day and momentarily throughout the day, you should keep a clear conscience between you and God, and you should learn to confess your sins, all right? But Paul talks about a different judgment here. He talks about something called the judgment seat of Christ, and that's a specific thing. I heard one time years ago someone say, well, that's not an actual judgment, that's like saying when I tell my kid to pick up the room, I don't really mean pick up the room. I mean, you know, uh, in your own way, decorate it how you'd like to. That's not what I said. I said, pick up the room. When he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, he means, get this, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You say, what does it say in the original Greek? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All right? I get so tired of people playing this game where they go, well, this word can be translated this way. If God wanted it that way, he would have given it to you that way. He gave it to you in that book the way that it is because he wants you to understand there's a judgment even for you saved folks that you're going to face in the future. All right, now let me say this, just to make this very clear. This is different than the great white throne judgment. 
I was talking to some young people last night about what it means to be saved, and I showed them Revelation chapter 20, and I showed them how, look, this is the last judgment for anyone that has rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're going to be judged. It's the final judgment. You say, why would God even do that? Why would God let someone go to hell immediately after their soul leaves their body if they're not saved, and then after all of that torment for however many years are there, pull them back out so he can say, I never knew you, and you're going to lake of fire. You may say, that's sadistic of God. No, guys, it's not. It's like this. Number one, if, God, if they want a way out, they can have it with Jesus Christ. You, you may say, God is so mean. No, God is so loving that he allowed his son to be tortured and whipped and stripped of his clothing and mocked and beaten. And God himself poured his wrath on his son so you wouldn't have to go to hell. That's the love of God. That's the mercy of God. But consider this. The reason that God would say, listen, I'm not just going to leave them there. I want to have a judgment with them is because God is righteous. And God wants to make sure that person understands and knows this is why you're here. You say, look, it's only fair that a judge gives a sentence and doesn't just throw somebody in jail. Guys, the laws that we have on the books, they're biblical in nature. The foundation for the legal system, you're innocent till proven guilty, unless it's social media, right? Uh, you know, but, but other than that, you're innocent till proven guilty, right? Where does that come from? The Bible. Now, I had a situation, and I'm not going to go into the details, uh, with my company. We have a field staff that goes to work in these different projects, and uh, I said I won't go into the details. It's, it's, a, it's a story. You want to hear it? Okay, I'm going to tell you, all right? So you've got, this, is, sounds, this sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. You have a Russian dude and an African dude that are working on a construction site. And the Russian dude literally says, hey, you're my friend. And he gives him some chocolate. Look, have, friend, have chocolate, you know. And, and the guy eats the chocolate. And he goes, let me have another one. He gives you another one. Before you know it, he's dizzy. Something ain't right about this chocolate, amen. <laughs> and so anyways, long story short, the cops come and they show, look, they show, look, look, look. Here's how we're going to do this. The reality is, okay, you have no witnesses you could still press charges, but I'm telling you, you press charges with no witnesses, it's pretty much hearsay. You say, where does that come from? The Bible. You've got to have at least one witness, and ideally two or three. All right? So the point is this, guys. The point is that God is not just going to have someone go to hell and leave them. He's going to let them know, this is why you're there. And that's only fair for God to do that. Now listen, there's a judgment, and that's for the lost. If you're saved tonight, you're not going to have to go there. Thank God for that. But let me just say this, all right? There's still a judgment that you have to face. Now, we're going to see this judgment is not a determination of whether or not you're saved. If you're there, it's because you're saved, all right? Uh, look at Romans chapter 14. Like I told you, we're going to look at a lot of Scripture. Uh, but the judgment seat of Christ is for Christians, and it's a day of reckoning. It's a day of giving account of your life. We're going to look at this in, in more detail. Romans chapter 14, and I want to remind you that when Paul writes Romans, he's writing all the saints that be in Rome, beloved of God, all right, uh, that called to all the church to be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace and peace to you by God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to save people, all right. Romans 14, look at verse number 12. Romans 14, verse 12. So then, every one of who? You know what that is? That's including himself. He's saying, me and you. And I'm going to tell you the same thing he said. Me and you. Every one of us, if you're saved tonight, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, now here's one thing you can be sure of in, the, in, in life. Death. People say death and taxes. Um, some people evade taxes. You know that? So there's at least death and judgment. And the only way you're going to get out of death is if you're saved and the rapture happens in your lifetime. Outside of that, everybody else dies. But you know what you're going to have to face? The Bible says, as is appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, I want you to be familiar with some phraseology here, right? Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Some phrases that are connected with this thing called the judgment seat of Christ. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look, if you would, real quickly, 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse number 12. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 12, and it says this, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against, what's the last two words? 
that day. All right, look down at verse number 16. Verse, or verse number uh, 18, rather. Verse 18, the Lord grant unto him, talking about Onesiphorus from verse 16, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. You know what he's talking about? There's a future judgment for believers. And he's saying, man, this guy Onesiphorus, he took care of me, and he refreshed me, and he wasn't ashamed of me when I was in my bonds. Guys, think about it like this. If there was a guy that the government was after and they kept throwing him in jail and he shows up at your house and he's a brother in Christ, he's like, let's have a prayer meeting. You're like, oh, I'll pray for you, brother, inside the house. Amen. You stay out there. I'll pray for you over here. Onesiphorus wasn't ashamed of Paul. He, he entreated him as a brother and he was a blessing to him. And so Paul says, Lord, I pray that you remember that in that day. Because there's coming a day when every Christian will be judged according to what they did with what God gave them in this life since they were saved. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You're going to see this thing again. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, there's uh, five crowns you can gain at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm not going to talk about them right now. Maybe get to them later. But 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 8. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, get this, the righteous judge. He never gets it wrong. Amen. You know, there's some judges that get it wrong. And there's some juries that get it wrong. But you know what you got in Jesus Christ? You got a man that doesn't ever get it wrong. He's right on the money every single time. He says, the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at, what is it? You noticing that phrase, that day, that day, that day, that day? There's a reason for that. All right, here's another one. Look at Philippians chapter number 1. Go back a little bit. Philippians chapter number 1. I, I want you to be familiar with that, that while 1 Corinthians 3 and, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 are the main passages that discuss it, this is not an isolated theme to those passages. All, uh, when Paul writes to Christians, and he writes the different letters that he writes, he wants them to be aware that, look, I want you to be cognizant. I want you to be aware. I want you to be mindful of how you're living right now in light of the fact that someday you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, not your pastor, not someone at church, but Jesus Christ, whose eyes are as a flame of fire, and he's going to look at everything you've done since you've been saved. And how are you going to do? Are you going to have anything to show for it? Is it going to, listen, I know some Christians that... that, that have made some great money, and, and they're influential in the community, uh, but they're not using their influence for Jesus Christ. And when they get up there, you know what they're going to have? They're going to have a big bonfire. It's going to be wood, hay, and stubble, and that's it. Listen, that's not what I want. Uh, I, I've, we, we have that, that fall thing out of our house, that fall fellowship every year. You get that fire going, and boy, you throw hay in there. You, you want to get a fire going. You grab some of that old straw hay, and that stuff just poof. You and I don't want, I don't want my life when I get to the end. And listen, I don't mean this to be mean, but even if nobody on planet Earth gave me any kind of legacy, and they go, Adrian who? Who's that? Pastor what church? I don't even know what you're talking about. If no one remembered, no one recognized, that doesn't matter to me as much as it does Jesus Christ remembering what I did for him. And when I get there, I don't want it to be this big bonfire of, listen, look at all the time you wasted. Look at all the energy you wasted. Look at all the money you wasted. And listen, I get it. We are working, we've got families, we've got stuff. But man, everything we do should be in light of the fact that someday there's a payday coming in eternity. And, and people paint heaven like this place where, listen, the God's never going to say anything that's going to bother me. Let me tell you something. The judgment seat of Christ, you know what he says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Now I know some of you are like, well, I don't like this preaching. I know you may not, but it's good for you. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He's not talking to lost people there, guys. And he's not talking about a lost soul's judgment. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. All right, Philippians chapter number 1. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, why did I get saved if I'm still going to get judged? Trust me, trust me, trust me when I tell you it's much better for your works to be burned up or your works to go through a fire than for you to go into a fire for eternity. All right, Philippians chapter 1, look at verse number 10. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till what day? Day of Christ. What is that day? That's the day that you get taken home and you stand before your Savior. All right, look at the same chapter and look at Philippians chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 2 
Philippians chapter 2 and look at verse number 16. I'm trying to show you that this is not an isolated thing. This is not a, he mentions it one time and, and we're extrapolating some new doctrine from these two verses. It is a consistent theme throughout Paul's writings. And the reason for that is, is he, he wants us all the time, you'll, you'll notice this, he always wants us to think about the end. And it's not just Paul, it's the Holy Spirit through Paul. The Lord wants us to consider not just where we're at right now, but where we're going to be at in eternity. You go, well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Praise God. But don't you want something to show for the life that God gave you on this earth? Amen. See, this judgment allows for you to get something to show. Some people go like this. They go, well, I'm just going to be glad to be there. I don't care if I have any rewards at all. You'll change your mind when you get there. <laughs> Trust me. It's almost like the kid, listen, we've experienced this, the kid that goes, uh, we got 4-H project going on, and there's all this work, and I've got to keep these record books, and I, all this stuff that they want me to do. You know what 4-H really is? It's preparation for government documentation like taxes. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's a government-sponsored thing. You know that, right? And so they're, you know, I'm learning about this animal. I've got to write this down. And how much I spent on it, how much food I spent, and how much food dad spent is what it really is, and, and how much this and how much that and, and how much time and all this stuff and all these records. And I just, I'm so tired of it. And then fair comes around. And when fair time is there, it's almost like, oh, man, I'm so glad I stuck with it. And, man, this is great. And I hope I get first place. Well, you were just saying a week ago you hate 4-H. <laughs> It's almost like the Christian that says, ah, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just glad I'm saved. I'm just glad I'm going to get there. You'll think differently when you get there. All right, the point is this. The point is God wants us to get that there is a judgment for us. And, and while I will tell you right up front, if you go to this judgment, you're saved. You don't have to worry about the eternal destination of your soul. But you do have something to be concerned with in regards to how you live as a Christian. Let me give you a couple things that, that, to think about tonight, right? Number one, who is this judgment for? If I haven't made it clear enough, it's for you. All right, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Let me show you something. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Like we said before, Wednesday nights meet lovers night, amen? So we're looking at a lot, of, a lot of scripture here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse number 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, Unto the what? Verse 2. The church of God. You know what that is? Which is at Corinth. That, he's talking to believers. So when you go a couple chapters later in chapter 3, and he's talking about this thing called the judgment seat of Christ, he's talking to you. All right, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Go one book over, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Now there's some tricky things in the Bible, I'll admit that. For example, uh, there's John. And then there's 1 John. Anybody ever get confused about that? All right, you know, like, you know, let's go to 1 John. Well, I was at the 1 John. It's over here, you know. All right, but, but I promise you, when you go from 1 Corinthians to 2 Corinthians, they're right next to each other, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Now, Achaia was a region of Macedonia where Corinth was a city that was in that region. It'd be like me saying to the, the saints of New Heights Baptist Church in the city of Aurora and to all those that are in Colorado. All right, that's what Paul is saying. He's writing to the believers in that part of the world. So you know what we get from this? When he goes about four chapters later and he talks about the judgment seat of Christ, he's talking to believers. All right. So the first thing tonight to understand is this. Who is it for? It's for you. Now, I think you understand that. I don't want to harp on that for too long. But let me give you this secondly. What is this judgment for? What's it for? All right. We understand that the judgment of Calvary is God's, God pouring out his judgment on sin on Jesus Christ so that we could be saved. We understand that the judgment of self is a daily thing that we do where we talk to God. And listen, I talked to someone about this last night. You reading the Bible is God speaking to you. And you praying is you speaking to God. And in any relationship that's going to work the right way, it's a two-way street, right, gentlemen? She's talking and you're drifting off in a la-la land thinking about the score from the last game. And she goes, are you listening to anything I'm saying? All right, you don't want to live that way, right? Happy life, happy wife, happy life, right? And so if you want to have a happy relationship and a good relationship with the Lord, you know what there's got to be? Communication. So there's a judgment of self, and that's daily. 
This other thing we're talking about right now, all right, this is something that's coming ahead in the future in your life. The question right now is, what is it for? Now, I wanna, I'm going to put out there uh, something I want you to consider. This is not necessarily a judgment on sin. There, there, I, I know I might be splitting hairs a little bit, but the judgment on sin is taken care of at Calvary. The judgment you're looking at now is a judgment that has to do with your labor for Jesus Christ. Let, let me show this to you. Look at Ephesians chapter number 2. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, if you're familiar with uh, verses 8 and 9, do you know what you learn? Contrary to a lot of religions today, and whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the stations of the cross, or whether it's reaching nirvana, or whether it's giving to ties to the LDS church, you can call it whatever you want to. All of it's the same thing. It's all a system of humanistic works where you're doing something to earn God's favor. All right? And we understand that doesn't work for salvation. All right? The only thing that works is Jesus Christ's work on the cross. However, look at Ephesians 2, and, and just read real quickly verses 8 and 9. You understand from reading verses 8 and 9, verse 9 says, Not of works are we saved, right? Not of works, lest any man should boast. However, look at verse 10. You know what you learn from verse 10? We're not saved by good works, but we're saved unto good works. You know what that means? You could not save yourself. You could not work your way into heaven by being good. But now that you are saved, now that you have trusted Christ as your Savior, the Lord says, okay, I'm going to take you, I'm going to make you a shining example, I'm going to make you a trophy of my grace, so live a clean life. Live a life where you're not constantly looking over your shoulder and wondering, when is that thing going to catch up to me? When is that unconfessed sin? When is that thing going to uh, finally rear its ugly head? When is that thing that I haven't dealt with going to catch it? Listen, that's a terrible way to live life as a child of God. You need to learn to deal with those things and deal with them well. You say, why? So you can be free from that. Listen, it's hard to... I'll put it to you like this, guys. It is hard to commit to the Bible and, and to being in church and to reaching out to other people if you're constantly drowning yourself. Do you know what they tell you? Listen, if someone's drowning, you know what happens oftentimes? Someone else jumps in and tries to save them, and they pull them down as well. You know what they say? Try to get them a lifesaver. You say, why? Because then they can stabilize, and then somebody can help them, unless they're a certified lifeguard like Jesus Christ. But the point is this. The point is, if, you are, if you're entangled with sin and with the affairs of this life, you don't have time to labor for him. You know, I've, I've learned this, and I'm, I'm going to try to help you out. I'm going to try to help you out. Uh, the, 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 the folks that really struggle with just being consistent in their walk with the Lord are the ones that refuse to deal with things from 10 years ago. And it's almost like, let me just patch it up, and then I move on. Listen, that doesn't work. You're not free to serve God when you're in debt over here. And you understand that. It, listen, if, if somebody comes to you and says, you want to buy my car, I don't have the money. Well, for 40,000 easy installments of $20, you can do it. Well, I don't want to do that, right? There, there's always this loophole, right? Like I could just, I could, I can make it work. No, you can't. And you just keep digging a hole and digging a hole and digging a hole. And you're not free. Yes, and there are some folks tonight that the reason why they're not in church is because they're $30,000 in the hole. They've got to get themselves out. I'm not throwing stones at them. I'm just giving you a physical example of a spiritual thing. If you're here tonight and you're saved, you know what you ought to want to do? You ought to want to serve Jesus Christ with all of your life. I'm not talking about riding the fence. I'm not talking about, you know, I'll, I'll go to church here and there. I'm talking about, Lord, now that you saved me, there is nothing more worthwhile in my life than doing something for you. But you can't do that if you're entangled with sin. So the Lord tells you, look, I saved you not by good works. I saved you by what Jesus Christ did, but I saved you on two good works. Why? Because there's a whole world out there that doesn't know what it means to have peace with God, and you can be an example to them. And so you know what you have? You have the Lord saying, I want you to labor for me. Look, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We're going to flip-flop between 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse number 9. And then we'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and look at verse 9. Wherefore we labor... Look at that. There's a mention of labor 
right before the verse that says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You say, why? The whole point is it's connected to what you're doing for the Lord. All right, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 9. For we are laborers together with God. Look at verse 10. He likens at the end of that verse, he likens your labor to building something and to working in, in, a, in a vineyard, if you will. All right, look at uh, verse number 13, same chapter. 1 Corinthians 3, 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. All right, look at the end of that verse. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Look at verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. Verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. The whole point is this. This judgment is to judge what you have done since you've been saved for the Lord. Now, let me go a step further. This is how we judge things between you and me. Oh, man, he built a big church. That guy did something for God. This is how we judge things. I gave this to somebody. I did something good. Can I, can I help you out a little bit? Uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Who here wants to get something when they get out to the other side? Who wants to have a treasure up there? All right, well, let me help you out. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go back there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And look at the end of that verse in verse 13. It says, The fire shall try every man's work. Now, the work is definitely judged. We see that. The question is, what about the work is judged? Is it simply a matter of what you did? Nope. Look at the end of that verse. It says, The fire shall try every man's work. And there's no period there. It continues. Of what sort it is. You know what that means? Why did you do what you did? You know what, that goes a little bit deeper. Gentlemen, it's nighttime, you're tired, you're about to lay down, and right about the time your head hits that pillow, oh, honey, could you get me a glass of water? <laughs> your, laugh, your laugh gives it away, brother. <laughs> Amen. I've been there. All right? And so you know what happens? You, what happens is you, you go, yes, I'll get you some water. Here's your water. <laughs> now let me ask you a question. Did you do what she asked you to do? Sure. How'd you do it? And why'd you do it? I did it so she shut up and I go to sleep. All right. Well, let me tell you something. You're not winning any points that way with her, right? Well, let me put it to you like this when it comes to your relationship with the Lord. I came to church. Okay. <laughs> Bless me if you can, preacher, you know. I got up in the morning. I read my Bible. I was supposed to read my three chapters. Here's my three chapters. I'm done. I wish I could have slept in. I gave somebody a track. Why? Because I told God I would. Here, read about Jesus. <laughs> you, say, you say, you're doing the right stuff. Why are you doing it? You know, it's like the guys that go and the Lord is sitting over there and he's watching. He's watching as they're, they're passing the proverbial offering plate there in the temple. And the Lord's just watching and he's watching how they give. And, and this one, you know, they're, they're walking down. It's dun, dun, ta da dun, ta da dun. And the guy's pulling out his $100 bill. And everyone's, oh, look at that. He's doing such a good job. And then this poor lady comes up and she throws in two pennies. And the Lord goes, boys, let me show you something. Oh, what is it, Lord? She gave more than anybody. <laughs> he's a carpenter. He's not a mathematician. He, obviously, he got this wrong. Um, Lord, uh, let me help you out. Uh, she didn't give all that much. No, no, boys, you need to listen. Shut up and listen. He says, Lord, talk like that. Watch him talk to Peter sometime. And he says, hey, just listen, boys. Be quiet and listen. So I'm going to teach you something. She gave all that she had, and she did it with the right heart. These guys did it out of their abundance, and they did it to be seen. Why would you come to church tonight? Well, my wife dragged me. Well, you just lost your reward. <laughs> you know, uh, why are you here? My, my parents made me come. Okay, well, there goes that, vanishing up, up in smoke. Like that. And I'm not talking about Cheech and Chong either. <laughs> Be careful when you say stuff. But seriously, you know what happens as a Christian? You get up there and you go, Lord, look at all the great things that I did for you. Okay, well, let's talk about that. You know, I did see that you went to church. I saw you were there pretty much every time the doors were open. But 
you know, two-thirds of the time you went in there with the wrong spirit and you went there because you felt you had to, not because you wanted to. And when you gave that offering, it was because, man, that pastor kept mentioning, give with the cheerful spirit, we want to help the missionaries. And you're like, uh, you know, I spent a lot on Christmas gifts, I guess I better give something. <laughs> and you didn't do it because you loved him. And I'm telling you, you know, there's something to this thing, and it has to do with having charity and having love for God. Think about this. What is the first and great commandment? The first and great commandment, according to Jesus Christ, is to love your Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. The humanist gets it backwards, and the religionist today gets it backwards, where it's all about man and loving fellow man, and, and you can't ever talk about sin, because if you do that, you're not loving man. Listen, man, first you love God, then you can love people the right way. And if you love God, then you'll tell people the truth, because you love them. But you love God more than anything else. And when it comes to your relationship with God, think about this. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. And I'm not going to apologize for preaching from the King James Bible. I'm going I'm I'm to tell you there's a reason why I do that. I believe this book. And, and let me go a step further. I don't believe it's the same as an NIV or, 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 or anything else. Now, some may have questions about that. I understand that. We will address that. I'll do a series completely on why we believe this book is the Word of God. I'll be glad to do that. But let me say this. The wording in this book is superior to any other book out there. Right. Let me give you an example, all right? The word love today. What does the word love mean? Depends on who you ask, doesn't it? <laughs> ask a teenager. Oh, I just love him. <laughs> oh, he's just so wonderful and he listens to me and he's going to, you know, we're going to get married. <laughs> you know. And, and he really loves me for who I am. And, you know, and, and it, yeah, they, listen, let me help you. Teen I know some of you aren't going to like what I'm about to say. Teenagers, I love you. Don't hate me for saying this. I was where you were at not all that long ago. You might look at me and go, you're old. <laughs> I'm not that old to remember. I can remember how it was to be a teenager and think, I love her. Oh, I love her. Oh, she pretty. Oh, you say what? Think like a caveman when you're that old. You don't know what love is. You know what, oh, pretty, oh, attract. You understand that. You don't understand sacrifice and getting up at 2 in the morning because the baby's crying. You learn what love is in life. And you grow in love. This idea, I just fell in love when I first started. Listen, I thought my, no, buddy, we haven't even gotten to you yet. <laughs> Listen, I didn't, when I looked at my wife at 13 years of age, and she walked into church, and I went up to her, and I said, it's good to have you, and I'm so glad you're here, and she looked at me like, why are you shaking my hand, you know, and I didn't think, I love, I just thought, she's pretty. <laughs> I didn't know what love is until much later, but you ask the world, what is love? Well, depending on some people, it's an emotion. It's a feeling. And, you know, I, you know, I got married 15 years ago, but I fell out of love with my spouse, and I fell in love with this. No, you fell into lust. There's a difference. So the word love can be twisted to mean all kinds of things, but you take the word charity. You know what charity is? Charity is love at the highest level. You say, why? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten Son. You say, what is that? That's love at the highest level. Love that gives. That's what charity is. Guys, you want to prove to your wife you love her? I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what it is right now. <laughs> you guys want it or not? I don't know if you want it or not. I'm going to give it to you. All right, let me, let me tell you how you do this. And everyone's going, well, we got kids. No, 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 calm down. Calm down. <laughs> the way you do that is you do something for her that she would want to do and you wouldn't want to do. And you do it with the right attitude because you love her. And you do it, you, I have no, listen, man, I don't, I could care less if I ever saw another Christmas Hallmark movie the rest of my life. <laughs> but you know why I do it? And I do it because I love her. And, and let me tell you something, there, I'm sure she doesn't wake up and go, I wonder what the score is on the game. You know why she'll sit with me and put on the, the jersey and the sweater and sit with me and go, yay, team, yay, she loves me. Now, now, ladies, you want to show your husband that you love him? Submit to an imperfect man. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it, but that's love. It's love. You say, what is that? That's charity. Now, look what Paul says about this. First Corinthians chapter 13, look at verse number 1. 
Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I've met people like that. Oh, they get up, and every time they get up, they give a testimony. And by the way, uh, you know, if it's a testimony night, that's not a preaching night. There's a difference. Yeah, I, I've seen some people get up and, well, the Bible tells us. And, you know, if you dig a little bit further and you learn the original Greek says this, and, and they're just blah, blah. You know, I'm hearing the whole time, tang, 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 tang. I'm hearing nothing. You say, why? Tinkling symbol. When someone gets up and they're shaking and they're nervous and they're red in the face and they don't know what to say but they want to be blessing their church family and they're stuttering over their words and they do the best they can, I like that. You say why? Because they love the Lord. When someone gets up and they're about to sing a special and they're, when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. I look at that and go, you can keep it. Oh, I can, they can sing. I don't care. I don't care how talented you are. Keep it. You say, why? Because you're not doing that for Jesus Christ. You're doing it to be seen. I don't get, I don't have, some of you may, I mean, I mean, some of you may have a problem with this. I enjoy every once in a while someone getting up, and I don't think Brother St. John would mind me saying this. He's tone deaf. Couldn't hear, he couldn't sing, he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. He didn't care. And when he got to sing, brother, it would make me want to shout. You say, why? Because he meant it. He loved God. Look what it says here in verse number 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity. Look what it says. It profiteth me nothing. Do you know what a profit is? Kids, let me help you out. A little bit of economics tonight, okay? If mom and dad give you $5, and they say, look, I'm going to lend you $5 because I want to get 5 back, that means you've got to have 10 at the end if you want to keep 5 for yourself. All right? You say, what is that? That's called a profit. Now, uh, in this age, everybody wants everything for free, and they don't realize it doesn't work that way. You have to have a profit to be able to invest to buy more stuff. I want free health care. Sucker, they're going to take it from somebody. Where do you think it's going to come from? All the rich. Hey, listen, there's only so many of them around. Eventually, they come for you, man. So here's the deal. If you want to have a profit, that means you've got to invest in what's given in you to have a return on that investment when he comes back to get his. So you know what Paul says? If I don't have charity, it profits me. You say, what is he thinking about? I think he's thinking about the judgment seat of Christ. You say why? Because that's when he gets to see his treasure. He says, if I have not charity, it profits me nothing. So the question tonight is, when you do what you're doing for the Lord, are you doing it because you love him? You want to please him. Listen, I understand there are times where we say you sc- literally scrape yourself out of bed so that you can have some prayer time with the Lord. And the moment you do that, you may not be thinking glory, glory, hallelujah. You might just be thinking, oh, I want to sleep. But at some point in that conversation with God, there needs to be a changing from oh, to Lord, I'm just thankful we had this conversation and I love you so much and you've been so good to me. You say, what, that change, you say, what is it? It's a motive thing. It's not just what you're doing, it's why you're doing it. When we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, what God is going to judge is your works and how and why you did what you did for him. The question further is this, how does he do it? How does God do that? Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, go back there, and I want to remind you of something that's mentioned here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and look at verse number 13. Aren't you glad to know what's coming ahead in your life? Amen. It's good to learn that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by what? And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so... As by fire. You're not going to lose your salvation, but you can lose your rewards. The things that God wants to give you. How is this going to be judged? How does God do this exactly? Uh, Keep your hand there and go, if you would, to uh, Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 19. And as you turn there, I want to remind you what Job says in Job 23. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. How do you refine gold? There's a fire. You know what Job says? 
When he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Uh, and Peter says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. You say, what is that? It's a reminder, even in this life, when we go through problems and trials, it's like going through a little bit of a fire. That's what's going to happen when we go up there with our works. And depending on how we react to the stuff down here, that determines what we get up there. Are you guys with me? And so over, over in, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 1, I want you to look at verse 14, when it describes, I've always thought this would be cool. I've always thought it'd be great to have a manger scene. You've got the wise men. Now, don't get too spiritual. I know the wise men weren't there when he's a baby. They go to the house. They don't go to the manger. But just for the sake of unison and all that, well, the, the wise men are there. You know, you've got the shepherds that are there. You've got Mary, and you have Joseph. And instead of a baby in the manger, you've got a grown man on a white horse with eyes with the flame of fire shooting out like that. I've always thought that would be a cool manger scene. <laughs> you say, why? Because that's how he's going to come back. He's not coming back as a baby. Revelation 1.14, His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a what? Look at Revelation 19. Go to Revelation 19. Now that's a sight of Jesus Christ that maybe you haven't considered. You know what you can do to me? You can, boy, you can bamboozle the preacher. You can bamboozle your spouse. You can fool everybody else around you. You can't fool the Lord. You know, let me tell you something. Here's, you know what the Bible talks about? The Bible talks about respecting of persons and, and not receiving a gift from somebody because a gift can pervert judgment. You know what you can't do with God? Listen, when I was in Bolivia, let me tell you something. The cops there were dirty, man. When people talk about dirty cops in America, I'm like, yeah, like one out of several thousand compared to like every one in Bolivia. You get pulled over in Bolivia and they're like, um, your taillights on. I'm like, no, no, it's, it's not. My taillights on. It looks out to me. No, it's, uh, and they just, they put their hand in the window, and you're like, how much? Yeah, that's right. Dead serious. I remember one time we were going through, I took Ariana with me to Santa Cruz to buy a bunch of groceries for my wife, and we go to the big city about three hours away, we come back, everything was great, we had a good time, we did grocery shopping, got her some American food, we we're running through the aisles, we're so happy, we get in the car, I got this thing loaded with food, right? I'm driving back, we have a great trip back, I get to the last checkpoint, where the military police are driving into the city we want to get into, and the guy goes, I get out of the car, I go to show my ID. He goes, that ID is no good. I said, yes, it is. I just got this in over here the other day. He goes, no, that's no good. I said, look, I know by the law, by international law, you've got to accept this. He goes, sorry. And you know what he did? At that time, right at that time, I remember telling Ariane, just sit still, don't do anything. She's uh, out, of, out of her seat, there's no car seats, and she's waving. And the guy looks over and he sees that I've got a kid with me. I'm, you know, the missionary from America, and I've got money. So, you know, I, I just looked at him and I said, look, I just want to go home. He says, well, if, you don't, you know, if we don't take care of this, I'd take you to jail. I said, how much? He goes, uh, $10. I'm like, fine. Now, some of you might go, oh, I can't believe you did that. You go there and you live that life and you tell me what you do, okay? But here's the point. You can bribe people. You can't do that with God. You're not going to be like, well, I went to church every Sunday. and I No, no, no. He's going to look right through the thing. He's going to see why you did what you did. Look at Revelation 19. Look at verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. You know, people look at things differently than God does. All I can see is what you do. Now, every once in a while, I get a glimpse based on something that, that people say. I'll give you an example. Well, I did this and they just, no one else helped me. Well, were you doing it for the Lord or were you doing it for people to notice you? Well, I did this at church and no one appreciated me. Well, listen, uh, Paul the Apostle, a very spiritual man, says, the more I love, the less I be loved. Join the club. I mean, if you're doing it for people, eventually some of that might just come out, might seep out of your mouth. But if you're doing it for Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter whether they like you, whether they say thank you, whether they appreciate it. Listen, I'm human. I want to be appreciated. I get that. I'm not discounting that. But the reality is if you're doing it for the Lord, that stuff doesn't stop you because you're doing it for him. You're not doing it for them. Listen, I learned a long time ago, if I, if I went around in a survey of, what do you think of my message? And, and, and what, there's one person that I asked beside the Lord about my message. You say, who's that? It's my wife. You say, why? Because she'll be brutally honest. 
you say, well, he says, you know, 17 years of marriage. Says, uh, that was a bum, honey. That was just there. You know, no, I'm just kidding. She's usually very encouraging, but, um, but, but the point is this. If I went around and asked, what are you thinking? What are, you know what that shows? I'm too worried about you and not pleasing him. I can't tell you how many Christians burn out because they're doing stuff and they're doing stuff and they're doing stuff. And eventually they go, no one else is doing it. That's why you're doing it. I mean, sometimes stop and sit back a little bit and think about it. You know, th- listen, I, I don't know about you, but I, I like to be in a position where I can contribute to something. Right. And sometimes you go, I'm all by myself and no one's helping me. Well, listen, you've got an opportunity to do something for God there. Right. Your motive will be revealed how? His eyes. You know what the Bible says in Samuel? It says, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I refused him, talking about Saul, for the Lord seeth not as men seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Don't tell me you don't. I love the modern Christians like, oh, I don't do that. Whatever. You know how I know you do that? If I give you a choice between giving a gospel track but to an old lady at a gas station or some biker dude or some gangbanger, you're like, here, sister, take this. You know why? Because you look on the outward appearance. Now, let me tell you something. I've learned this a long time ago. The guys that look scary, those are the guys you want to talk to. I like those guys. You say, well, I can have a conversation with them. And they don't get all offended. These thin-skinned millennial kids, you tell them anything about Jesus Christ, they lose their mind. They can't handle it. That, that biker guy, he's been through some stuff, and he knows the guy's telling him the truth when he's telling him the truth. But that said, I digress. The point is this. We look at things differently than God does. Go to John chapter 21. We're going to go ahead and, and wrap this up tonight. I've got some other points, and maybe we'll finish them next week. I think we will. Um, I, I wish I could be the preacher that gives you the, the material all in one night. I don't know how to do that. You go, well, because you preach too long. Okay, but let me tell you why I'm, I'm giving you everything I'm giving you. I want you to get the message. Amen. I want you to get it. Look at John chapter number 21. John chapter 21. And I want you to understand what's going on here in John 21. This is where we're going to wrap everything up. Peter has denied the Lord. He denied the Lord before Jesus was crucified, and he denied him three times. Now, the Lord keeps track of things really well. He's not like us. I got some times where people that work for me, I can't remember what day did they ask off, and did they take off that day, and did they fudge the numbers, and did they say they were working when they weren't working, and I can't remember, God remembers everything. And Peter says, I don't know the man. Jesus who? What are you talking about? I don't know him. And he starts to swear and curse. You go, I would never do that. Yeah, but you get to a meal and a business meeting and you won't bow your head because you're ashamed. And, and, you'll, and you'll, you, won't, you won't yell and curse and swear, but when you have an opportunity to speak up for Jesus Christ, you'll deny him that. And when the pastor gets up and says, hey, we got this opportunity here at our church, and here's this opportunity for you to serve, and the Lord's tugging on your heart, I know it's not everybody all the time. I get that. But he's tugging on your heart, and you say, ah, you're denying them. Now, Paul says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. The context of that denial is reigning with him. It is not about your salvation. It is about the rewards that you get at the judgment seat of Christ. The crowns that you get, the gold and silver and precious stones versus the wood, hay, and stubble. Peter denies the Lord three times. Look at John chapter number 21. After Jesus rose from the dead. Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, missed it. I did something wrong. Mom and dad didn't catch me. You know, uh, the wife didn't notice and didn't take out the trash. Or, you know, he didn't notice that I didn't pay that. But whatever the case, oh, I'm glad I got past that one. And then, you know, like a day later. You're talking, and, the, and mom goes to the kid and says, you know, I noticed something. You're like, oh, man. Peter denies the Lord three times. And the Lord rose from the dead, and there's that, that appearing where Thomas wasn't there, and they're excited. Peter sees, you know, runs to the tomb, and John gets there first, but John lets Peter in. And then there's the other instance where in the up, they're in the upper room, and Jesus, you know, shows up. You talk about sci-fi stuff. Walks through the wall, shows up, and he's in the middle of the, of the room, and the doors were shut. That's pretty cool stuff. That's the kind of stuff you find in Hollywood. It's in the Bible. 
And Jesus shows up right there in the middle of the room, and Peter goes and he touches him, and he, he praises him, and he, what a blessing. And Peter's going, this is awesome. And I'm sure I'm glad he's not brought up that one thing. And then there's that day when he's fishing, and he works all night long, and he throws the net, and he throws the net, and then daytime comes. And isn't it just like the Lord to wait until daytime after you've worked your tail off and you didn't catch a thing for him to say, hey, I got an idea, throw it on the right side of the net. And Peter throws it on the right side of the net. And he catches all of these fish. And all of a sudden, John points out, John being the disciple whom Jesus loved, he says, it's the Lord. And Peter takes off his clothes, jumps in the water, starts to swim in the land, and he's just happy to see the Lord. And he's just, ha he's just so happy he jumps. He forgets that he was in the boat. He forgets he worked all night. He's got adrenaline pumping through him. He's just excited that the Lord is there and the Lord wants to fellowship with him. You see, how does he know? Because there's a fire there and he's making some food and he comes to land. He goes, Lord, it's so good to see you. And, 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 he, and the Lord says, sit down, Pete. Let's sit and just dry off by the fire. And Peter's excited. He's, oh, man, it's going to be a great meal. Just me and the Lord. The other disciples are still out in the boat. They've got to get to land. It's just me and him. And the Lord says, hey, Pete, i got a question for you. Look at verse number 12. Jesus said to them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus said, cometh and taketh bread and giveth him and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. The Bible is the greatest history book there ever was. It happens to record the resurrection of the only man that ever rose from the dead on his own, and Jesus Christ. And it says this, so when they had dined, imagine that. You're sitting there by the fire, you've dried off, you've had a great meal, you're like, oh, remember that one time we rose that guy from the dead? Hey, remember that one time? Yeah, yeah. And Peter cut off the guy's ear, and Peter's like, shut up, man. I don't want to bring that up again, you know? And, <laughs> and, 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 and they're, they're sitting there talking about the old days and the stuff they did together, and they're having a good meal, and then they, they're done eating, and the Lord says, hey, Pete, lovest thou me more than these? Verse 15. Now, people have argued, what is the these that he's talking about? Is he talking about the disciples? Is he talking about fish? Because Peter's a fisherman. Uh, it could go either way. I'd, I'd say he's probably the fish, more than likely. You say, why? He lived for fish. He dreamed of fish. And here the Lord, the creator of the universe, makes the best fish there ever would be. And after he's eaten, after he's full, Peter's a good Baptist, he's, he's full, he's full of that fish and that bread. And the Lord says, hey, Pete, do you love me more than these? You know, Peter says, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Judgment of Christ, Jesus Christ is sitting on that throne, and I'm kneeling there. I'm not standing there, proud boy. I'm falling on my knees. Because you say, what, what is that? That's what happens when you stand before God. And he says, Adrian, you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Did you feed my sheep? Lord, I tried as best I could. Adrian, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Remember that Sunday, that one Sunday where you're driving and the sky's dark and it's gray and it's overcast and it's winter and the snow is coming down and you're just thinking you'd rather be at home than go and preach to people who don't want to hear what you have to say? Yeah, Lord, I remember that Sunday. Well, that one's gone, son. You say, why? Because I didn't do it with the right motive. Peter is looking at the Lord, and the Lord says to him in verse 16 again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? The Lord, and he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And right about the time that Peter's starting to get peeved, and Peter's a hothead, and he's He's saying to himself, he's about to get, he realizes it's the Lord, and he can't say what he wants to say, but he wants to say, shut up, why are we doing this? And about that third time, he goes, oh, I denied you three times. You want to hear me confess you three times. I get it. Now, before the Lord would ever use Peter like he does in Acts chapter number 2, do you know what the Lord does? He makes Peter sit by a fire, and he tries Peter. You know what the Bible says? We read it already in Revelation. His eyes were as a flame of fire. 
So when you get there, you don't fool anybody. It doesn't go through the prism of the pastor's eyes or the wife's eyes or the husband's eyes or the kid's eyes or some other Christian's eyes or Dr. So-and-so's eyes. It's the eyes of Jesus Christ. My belief, and this is what I honestly believe, I do believe I can teach this as a doctrine. I believe it's right and I believe it's sound. If you think about it, when Jesus Christ comes back, his eyes are as a flame of fire. In glory, that's how his eyes appear. And so when we sit before Jesus Christ, what I believe is going to happen, and maybe your mind is tainted with Hollywood, and all you can see is some weird, like, superhero movie where someone's shooting lasers out of their eyes. Where do you suppose they get that stuff, by the way? You say, what happens? Everything I've ever done. And the Lord says, okay, let me look at that. Boom. Gold. Well done. Silver. Well done. That was hay right there. That one's gone. That was stubble. You see that's going to happen? Yep. question is, in light of that, should that change our lives? Should it change why you do what you're doing? Listen, you come to church, praise God. I'm glad you're here. I, you know, sometimes I say stuff and you think, well, I'll just stay home next time. I, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm... <laughs> I'm glad that you're here. I'm just trying to get you to think, why are you doing what you're doing? Why would you? I, I, I'll never forget. One time I was in Bible school, and Brother Donovan's talking to the young Bible school students, and he says, it's like this, gentlemen. He said, some of you will plaster your car with stickers. He said, that's a blessing. You put scripture all over your car. That's great. He says, but are you doing that to get noticed, or are you doing that to be a blessing to somebody else? No, I, you know, I'm, I'm a 17-year-old kid. I'm like, well, of course they got the right motive, you know? I learned later that's not always the case. You say, why? Because I know myself. And what the Lord does is he gives us a reminder of what it's going to be like there. And, and, and you know what he does that for? He does that so that you can have your mind in the right place so that when you get there, you have some rewards to show for it. Now, because we ran out of time, and I'm sorry that we went longer than normal, um, I'm going to finish this next week. I don't want you to think it's all doom and gloom. There's a real positive side to this, all right? But you know what happens when you're trying to tell someone about how to get saved? You don't tell them God loves you, number one. You know, the first thing you tell them is you're a sinner. Amen. Number two, your sin desire, d d requires a payment. Number three, that payment's eternal, it's in hell. Number four, you don't have to go. Now, that sounds like good news. But if you start off with God loves you, oh, of course he does. I'm pretty good. I go to church. I'm not a bad guy. Hey, listen, we've got to start over here so the good news makes sense. When it comes to the judgment of Christ, same thing. Next week, we're going to talk about the rewards and the opportunities and, and all the good stuff. So if you're like, man, I don't want to come back, come back for the good stuff. Amen? All right, let's all stand. We'll be dismissing a word of prayer.